Wriggles clear. Might just get the chip, and he does. He scores. Oh, oh what a great goal! He did it. Oh, brilliant goal! Wriggling his way in. That's an excellent ball. And he It's a goal. Four for Clyde Banks. Excellent play by Hughes. I think the square of the match and sweetly finished by Ken. In this week's episode, we welcome to the show returning guest Andy Cameron. I'm joined with Tom Brogan and Simon Weir for part one. Enjoy. Can I can I tell you a story? Aye. That happened in 1982. I went over with seven other guys, uh, and we stayed in two two villas. One in, two guys owned a villa each, so it was four in one and four in the other. John Gregg. Uh, and Peter Cormack hmm. were two, myself and uh, three other guys. So it was a golfing holiday, but we went to see the World Cup, which was great. And uh, we were sitting having a coffee right at the traffic lights in Marbella. And this bus draws up, and it was a Scottish team bus. And Joe Steen's in the front seat, just behind the driver. And he obviously said to the driver, open the doors. And the doors opened, and he said, Hey, you, I hope you're not drinking. I said, I am drinking. I said, I'm drinking coffee. I said, I can't drink alcohol. I said, because I'll be on the team for the Brazil game, eh? <laughs> and he just, you know, he, he just laughed because uh, the, bu- the bus moved away through the traffic lights. Mm. And uh, that just, when I think about that, it brings back memories of a great cup, World Cup. Mm. Although we could have got through but some of the stories that come from it, you know, yeah. were incredible. I, and reading, reading Martin O'Neill's uh, story about 1982 World Cup when Ireland did really well, they they beat Spain. Yeah. Uh, in Spain, Aye. which was incredible, you know. Yeah. So they, they, they thought they, they might have got to the semi final, but they didn't. Uh, and the, the semi final was, it was, the quarter finals was groups of three, you know, mm. and you played. Team once, so you played twice, but and they never get through that. And Yugoslavia get through, and West Germany beat them. And and then of course the great the game of the whole tournament was Italy versus uh, Brazil. Yeah, and everybody Brazil were fantastic in that tournament. But the boy and I can't remember his name was oh, Rossi, Franco Rossi just come to me, and he scored a hat trick in the semi final, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So did, um, we were talking about this before. Did, did you actually go to the 78 World Cup, Andy? No, I, I was really busy hmm. uh, because of the record. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, in the telly and everything. Yeah. I mean, well, the, great, the great story about that was the night we played Iran, uh, I was in the, the Tartan Arms in Bannockburn. You know, it's a pub and it's one of the, the great Scottish pubs. The food's great in it. And the guy's is, is sadly gone now, John McHugh. Lovely, lovely guy. And he, he said, I want to book you for the night we play around. I said, great. He says, you're doing your fit. Well, I just, I've got to, you know, <laughs> because Alex can't know that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's a great room to work. I love working it. So I said, when I get there, after we get to doing for uh, the, uh, who was it? The beer's chip, no, it's not chili. Uh, Peru. 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 I, and I said to him, John, I said, you need to let me on first, you know, before the fitba. And he went, no, no, no. He says, come on. He says, I says, Look, what happens if we get beat? I says, I, yeah, I can go in there. He says, no. He says, we'll not get beat. He says, you go in there. That's all right. So I've got the Scotland jersey, the tartan tab, the whole bit. And we, we drew one each. And I've jumped on the stage and grabbed the mic before I could speak. This big, a monster of a guy, right? He went, hey, wee man. Tell all the jokes you want. He says, see if you sing that fucking song. He says, you can write it. My last in memory. Hello, Simon. How you doing? Hello, Andy. <laughs> and that's my last in memory of the 78 World Cup. Yeah. But the 82, another World, another memory was uh, coming down after. We get a uh, memory, we get Brazil angry by scoring first with the toe poke, mm. as Jimmy Hill said. And he, uh, and they humped us 4-1. There's great stories that Alan Ruff tells, you know. But I remember coming out of that game. It was in Cadiz, uh, Seville. Uh, and we'd take our way back to uh, 
Marbella. Anyway, we're coming down, and the Brazilians are all, you know, it's all these young bronzed Brazilian lasses, right? <laughs> and they're dancing, and obviously there are nowhere really many bras, right? And there's this <laughs> big guy, I found out that he came from Cumnock, right? Look at that, hey, you know what I mean? <laughs> he, he indicates to one of the girls, uh, we change, you know, he was doing this, we swap jerseys, you know, yeah. and I swear to you, she had it like, up, and then it, it just, she realised, no, no, you <laughs> The only reason you want this thing, you know, it was, like, and some of, some of the things uh, that happened in that World Cup were fantastic. You know, I, I've got to tell you, I, I was at Rangers played Hibs a couple of months ago, two each draw, and I always look for Peter Cormack on that trip in this place called El Green, which is a restaurant in, in Aloha. And uh, we were there and we uh, were, you know, just sitting about. John Gregg was there, he was one of the group, and Peter Cormack. And <clears throat> Freddie Duda, who's a friend of mine uh, at the time, he says to me, why don't we have a sing song? He says, I'll get you names that people will go out and sing. And I said, that. He said, you compare it. I said, okay. So I, I've got all the names, you know, it's people from London, and it was great. Anyway, I says, Peter Cormack, uh, you, you went, ah, he says, I'll get you some. And he says, I need to speak to Oregon <laughs> player. I said, I heard it, Frank, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and he says, he got up and he sang, uh, Route 66, I am not kidding you. There was women swinging. <laughs> Honestly, God, <laughs> really, really handsome, Peter. And he sang Route 66. The place just erupted. It was fantastic. T talking about, it's nothing to do with the World Cup, but that guy that I spoke about, Freddie Duda. Freddie mm. Duda was a Polish uh, refugee at the end of the war. And he started a company called Cambridge Electrics in Cambridge Street uh, next day. Johnny Fuscos, which mm -hmm. was a barber, right? Yeah. And uh, he was a great friend of Willie Waddles, the Rangers player, manager, chairman. Uh, and he was a really nice guy. But I actually worked with his brother in the buses, Archie, Archie Duda, you know, they were both Polish. And Archie actually died, right? Just dropped dead. And uh, Tom Little, who was the, the garage manager, called me into the office. He said, did you hear about Archie Duda? And I said, no. He says, he just died this morning. He says, and we don't know, you know, how to tell his wife. I said, you need to send somebody. He says, well, that's why. He says, you know him. And I went, no. He said, just get it. So I'm going run. She, they stayed in St. Lord Drive. And I go up the stairs. And I, what, 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 how am I going to tell her? You know, anyway, I rang the bell. And she opened the door and I says, guess who died on the bus today? Do that. <laughs> so... Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. 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 <laughs> uh, and on that bombshell. <laughs> and on that bombshell. <laughs> yeah, we're suitably warmed up now. That's brilliant. 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 <laughs> Excellent. Right, so, yes, 1982 World Cup we're going to have a look at, which took place in Spain between the 13th of June and the 11th of July. Uh, so the magazine we're looking at is dated the 26th of June. Uh -huh. um, and the, So the competition would have been underway by this point, probably a, a week or two into it. Um, so let's take a look inside at the magazine cover. and Another beauty. There we go. So mm -hmm. the front page is a heading special previews of all the big World Cup ties, along with the Spain 82 World Cup logo, which is like a Spanish flag with, with a football, it's almost like a comet tail, mm. isn't it? Um, <laughs> very, very iconic, that. Uh, the ma the magazine flashes back to a couple of previous games with England beating the Czechs 1-0 in 78, and they say the same again in Bilbao. The other flashback is of Scotland against Brazil in the 74 World Cup that ended 0-0. Nil -nil. Uh, they say better luck in Seville, question uh, mark. So there's a photo of Tony Woodcock and... The Scotland one shows Danny McGrain and Kenny Douglas facing facing up to Jorginho. So there we have them two there. Um, cracking. We, we I can't see it, yeah. yeah, I yeah. See it. Uh -huh. So so we, we spoke about this um, just the other day, Simon, about the Scotland shirt. 
the Scotland strip yeah. at this point. Yeah. It's um, it's on its way. I mean, a lot of people think this is one of the best, but it's certainly for me on the way to being the best one. The genesis of it, isn't it? Yeah, and the Brazil, the classic Brazil one as well. You know, it's the throw. It's a mixture between seven. 70- and 82 it's the belt of a strip yeah beautiful that, 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 I mean I always look, the Brazil strips are fantastic but see to be honest you could have worn wireless suits and beat anybody yeah they were fantastic <laughs> <laughs> and a helmet aye. yeah <laughs> that's it you know it, made, it was just and you look at guys like Zico uh, and all these players it's fantastic and the big boy Socrates yeah I, mean, what? I think he got a PhD or something mm. yeah he was a doctor wasn't he yeah yeah, yeah something like that yeah. And I look at the players, the two Scottish players, and two of the greatest Scottish players ever. In, yep. fact, in my opinion, Douglas is the best ever Scottish footballer in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and Danny was up there. You know, when you think you two right backs, like Danny McGrain and Sandy Jardin. Yeah. You know, and one of them had to put left back and did it. No bother, yeah. you know. Incredible. Going back to the 74, uh, the 78 Cup, uh, World Cup, mm-hmm. there's guys went there and met young ladies. Yeah, and there's, there's kids. Well, there's adults going about now called Xavier Mackenzie and, and all yeah. that. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Pedro uh, Zander Gomez. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, and there was what, the submarine story as well. That's what, what I was. Yeah, I was just story. about to Jim say Tate. that one. Jim Tate, I, I knew Jim. He ran the bookies club in Hamilton, right? Uh, and he he said to me, "Have you heard?" I'm hiring a, a submarine. <laughs> you know, and, I, and at that time, I said, it's the old guy. I said, is that right? I said, Hamilton Mackey's heard that there's 20,000 leagues under the sea and he's one to one, man. He said, no, no. He says, I, I'm actually serious. And I said, what are you telling me for? He says, I want you to come in it. I says, I will give you peace. He said, no, I want you. And this, this is the one that done me. He says, I want you to be the entertainment officer. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, mm-hmm. I said, well, at least they can't jump overboard. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, really? yeah. Yeah. I always thought that that would have made an absolutely brilliant like sitcom or something like that. Would have done, yeah. aye. Would have done. I still could do. Yeah, still yeah. Could. There we yeah. go. Yeah. Pitched here. Right, let's let's get right. <laughs> so, do you see that? That, eh... Uh, I've got that other page up. No, the that Scotland team in '74. Yeah. And you think you had, you had Big Joe Jordan? Big, Big Joe Jordan's one of my favourite all time. But he, he just he just gave you everything, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, Big Jordan. And that was him. He went forever, and he was fantastic. I loved him. Yeah. See, you met him off at you know off the pitch. I met him at dinners and all that when he was at Hearts. The quietest guy you could ever meet. Lovely guy. Yeah. Mm. Did very well in Italy as well, didn't he? He was, he was just a big, he, he was, he was a big, big, you know, wonderful player. Sharp right. the elbow, no teeth, you know. That's right. And, uh, well, a, a, a proper target man, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely. think I think football fans appreciate that, don't they? They appreciate the, the the guy who will give everything and, but honestly, you know, give it give it yeah. in in an honest way. And Joe Jordan I, I've was always that. said that, and uh, you know, see Scottish football fans especially. That that's the only thing you you need to guarantee in your team that they give a hundred percent. If you give a hundred percent, they'll not turn on you. Mm. You know, but if they think for a minute that you've chucked it, they go for head. You know, yeah, absolutely. And it's and there's no way back from that. Yeah, no, no way back from that at all. No, yeah, you're a, you're a Peter Grant or you're a Mark Viduka. You know. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Peter the pointer, Peter the pointer, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're in inside the magazine now, pages two and three. The first first thing I'm going to look at is the shoot view. So a little editorial where they say the structure of English football from school pitch to international level needs a complete overhaul if England are to keep pace with the rest of the world in the next twenty years. They're going to say Ron Greenwood, who's announced his retirement from international management, shares this view. Uh, so Shute suggests that Greenwood be, should be offered a role at the FA to steer this reorganisation. Now, the article also mentions Bobby Robson as a likely uh. replacement for the England manager role. I, I, I thought it was interesting that um, Ron Greenwood would um, 
announce his retirement before the competition. It's, right. it, it just seems uh, a wee bit strange to do that. Uh, mm. But I, but what I take for that editorial there is <clears throat> he obviously knew a good manager. Bobby Robson mm. is, in my opinion, as good a re, uh, a good uh, an English manager as you'll get, and probably yeah. the most unlucky manager. You know. Because see, in Italy, I thought they had a real chance. Yeah. And then, mm-hmm. uh, they lo- they're getting penalties in the semi final. That was the night uh, Gascoigne started greeting because he got booked. Right. We knew he'd be at the final if they get through. And I think the Cameroon game had taken the legs out of them as well. The Cameroon right. game had taken the legs as well. So, oh, yeah. right. I get the blame for that as well. Everybody thought they were relatives of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Cameroon. Cameroon. <laughs> That, that, that had to build this show. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I and I mean, we know we're no sitting here saying, "Well, good England won tonight. I've got a chance of winning it." Mm. But what happens, happens, you know. We know yeah, we're yeah. going to win it. But uh, there's a lot, a lot of good teams in the World Cup. I think Brazil looked, and France look terrific. France uh, do, yeah. And Holland are always. Uh, they're always tasty as well, you know. Yeah, they're always there or thereabouts. I think tonight, you, you mean, because we're, we're talking on the night that England just beaten Wales and Wales had nothing to offer, really. No. You know, but, but there's still lots of good teams in there. You know, you see, even America went through. So USA went through against Iran tonight as well. So, yeah. So and, Holland, Holland, Holland have not impressed, but, well, but are those one of those steady teams that just are always quarter finalists? You know, you're, you're getting there. Right. So, get them in the ice, right? Who's your who's your who's your tip for the for it, Jink? Then Andy. Hey, uh, I, I do. I, I certainly fancy France. I think they're terrific. But yeah, you, you know, anything can happen in the knockout stages, Simon. Yeah, it could go to extra time and penalties, and yeah. you get uh, because you miss a penalty. You know, uh, yeah. that's that's the way of it. But uh, I, I I like to look at France and I like to look at Brazil, uh, and yeah, I'll yeah. tell you. There must be a surprise in there somewhere, you know. Well, I, it's that see, see the African teams. Yeah, yeah, done brilliant. There's some energy, haven't they? They've got incredible energy. Yeah, yeah. That's we were talking about this before. I mean, you wonder if the rest of the world is now caught up, you know, tactically. And if these are not tactically naive teams anymore, they're all very good defenses, and the players all play throughout Europe for top clubs. So there's no. Yeah. There's no mystery anymore. It's about time right. that these players are really caught yeah. up in the Asian teams as well and the Middle Eastern teams. So it's great to see. It's a proper, I feel it's yeah. a proper, you know, level pitch World Cup. Absolutely. The only thing I would say is Qatar, uh, the, I mean, they could have put 11 camels on the, yeah. the pitch yeah. and they would have done as well as the team. And they're only there because they're the home team. And in England, uh, I've got as good a chance as anyone. I'll tell you, uh, I see Foden scored for him tonight. Yeah, he he's a, a super. When when Mark Allen was the director of football at Rangers, um, I, I saw Foden on a, a, a an FA Youth Cup uh, thing. He right, was, I think he was about sixteen or something. And I said to him because he knew Man City he came for there, and I said, "The boy Foden." I said, "Can you do it? Come up here for a, a loan or something." He says, Pep Guardiola would shoot me if I suggested it. He says, that's the team boy. That's, that's the one yeah. he thinks is going to be the, the best player in the world, you know. Wow. And he is, he is a player, that boy Foden. And he so got his team as well, you know. Tonight was tonight was his first full start and scored, of course. You know? yeah. And Rashford came back to a game as well. Sickening as it is for me to admit, Rashford ran it today as well. Yeah. So, he's yeah. a smart player, isn't he? He's a great he's player. A player. He's got a as well, you know. Yeah. I've got a lot of time for him, you know. Who? Yeah. For Rashford. Oh, a smashing yeah. player. Yeah. And, a, and a decent human being too, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, that, 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 big surprises the... might be Belgium though. And that's because they have they were struggling, weren't they? When you yeah. get people like the boy, and the boy, Eden Hazard, who has just fallen away in form all, all together, you know. Yeah, and I think there's an age thing as well. Lukaku, Lukaku yeah. is injured. And, well, he got on the second game. Mm-hmm. But don't need to wait and see what happens in the third game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think they're spent though. I think that was what De Bruyne said about it as well. That the team's too old. We're not going to win anything. I think uh, if, if your best players saying that, it's not it's not going to be the best thing in the dressing yeah. room of the game. So 
Yeah, it's, it's, but it's a great. I mean, look at Saudi Arabia. The thing is wide open still. So Jeez. so far, it's been a great World Cup for football. I, I would say. Ah, it's incredible, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. Yeah. And I, I, and you watch it. Uh, I, I don't know what you think of VAR, but see, in seventy eight mm. uh, and, and seventy four, we were talking about VAR. VAR would have made a difference, you know. Uh, there was a couple of uh, games where penalties weren't given. Uh, yeah. And referees made really gross errors. Shocking and, and mistakes. Yeah, I would have sorted it, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I, d- I don't think it's actually been too bad. This this um, World Cup, the VAR, you know, during the league and no. European mm. stuff, it's it seems to have been really controversial. But I don't think yeah. there's really been that much controversy. I think, about it. I think it's worked. But it's very interesting. That we've got the microchip in the ball now as well. I mean, that that's the only thing that's annoying me a wee bit is the offside part and the linesman being very slow to raise the flag. That's I don't see the point of playing on. Somebody can get injured doing that. You know, exactly. You lose that's a silly rule, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, oh. uh-huh. It's a silly rule. But it's yeah, not even it's that. It's like there was somebody got booked today. Yeah, I think yeah. earlier on, and then it went to VAR for something, or yeah. you know, and it was like, well, what if somebody gets a second booking for for um, that's right for yeah, moaning yeah. at the or ref about a decision, and then it turns out the decision was wrong. Yeah. Uh-huh. So uh, I'm surprised there's only two English referees in it. You mm. know, uh, Oliver and uh, what's the other boy? And he he. It was a controversial thing yesterday with North Korea, or South Korea. Yeah. Uh, South he, Korea stopped, yeah. he didn't let them have a corner. Um, I, uh, it's really interesting. Mind you, I just think it's at the wrong time of the year. I think it's upset all the leagues in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Know? And part of it also is the teams haven't had time to gel together either. So England no. team had a, a week to get together. So, But it gives everyone else a chance, I guess. There's only I a couple so, of weeks, uh, a few weeks. But it's just that it's, it's not really... It's like not playing football on Saturday at three o'clock. Any yeah. other time seems wrong, you know, and it just seems like kind of it's a nine o'clock yeah. offs and things. But but there you go. It's it's very different. Yeah. But I think, it's, I think remember, on a whole, it's been great. Do you remember that when it was everybody kicked off at three o'clock? Yeah, and you got everybody Celtic part. They'd be saying, "How's how are they getting on?" And yeah. Ibrox yeah. would be saying, "How are they getting on?" You know. Uh, but now one of them plays on the Saturday, the other plays on Sunday, so. You know, yeah. if they win on the Saturday, it puts a bit of pressure on you to win the Sunday. Mm-hmm. But if they lose, then you say, well, that's us. I've got a chance here to go three points in front of whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it made Sunday remember- afternoons like a cup tie because everyone would be listening to the Chinese. I see. And yeah, it would go right. down and the atmosphere would change. 20 minutes to go, the atmosphere would change. I particularly remember Celtic 88 season was like that. The place would jump up and down for the last 20 minutes, you know, urging Celtic to go. And said that was a year where Celtic was scoring and winning late. Um, so, uh, so it's still doing. Yeah. You know, Celtic don't... Uh, this sounds as if I'm criticising I'm not criticising them at all. They don't respect any other team that they play against. They go, is that right? Yeah, bang. You worry yeah. about us, you know, they do. Yeah. Right, well, well, so we're, we're back on, um, we're looking at Brian Robson, he writes for you. Yeah. Robson sees no other outcome than England qualifying from their group. They've written off mm-hmm. Kuwait, and Robson thinks that they will need a minimum of three points from the first two games. Now, as it was, England won the first two games against France and the Czechs before drawing mm-hmm. with Kuwait, so it turned out that Kuwait was actually the hardest or the, you know, the, the worst result for them. Elsewhere on the page, there's West Germany's Paul Breitner, and he predicts a 2-1 victory for England against the Czechs, and they won 2-0. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, he was a player that... Uh, yeah, Paul Robson. Breitner. No, but Robson. Robson, Robson yeah, yeah. What a player. Yeah. He was... Uh, yeah. He had injuries as well, wasn't it? World Cups. Sorry? He things. Ah, he did, yeah. And Breitner, Paul Breitner was a great player as well for the Germans, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll jump on to the next one, next page, which is yeah. up front with Steve Archibald. So we've got a wee bit to talk about here. Now, Steve says, let Brazil worry about us. Uh, so the article says, Brazil and the USSR are the big games for Scotland. Now, Archibald mm. assumes that Scotland have already taken care of New Zealand, as this magazine had gone to press before the game had been played. Yeah. He says, it's vital Scotland get a good goal tally against the Kiwis to put us in a good position to qualify for the second round. In fact, our group could decide on who scores the most goals against New Zealand. Now, there's a... a, a... Uh, we won 5-2 as well. Yeah. 
So Archibald reckons Brazil and Scotland will move on to the next stage, although the USSR are, are touted as the dark horses of the tournament. The Brazil manager, Tele Santana, is wary of Scotland, and he says British football must always be respected. Scotland have some excellent players, and they're proven to be difficult to beat in recent seasons. As for the USSR game, Ramaz Shingalia doesn't believe his team are favourites to beat the Scots, having seen Dalglish, Sunis and Hansen in action in Europe. He's aware of the quality of the Scots, which also include Ipswich's Towns, Alan Brazil and John, John Mark. And he says Scotland have many players of this quality, so we know our task in Malaga against them will be severe. Well, Wally uh, uh, Miller and Alan Hansen, they, they still talk about the time they bumped into each other. Yeah, crash. Uh, 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 and I, I mean, I'm t- looking at Stevie Chat, Archibald's picture. There's mm-hmm. two famous footballers. There's quite a lot a way, way back, but in my lifetime, two most famous footballers that came from other than my hometown was Bobby Murdoch and yeah. Stevie Archibald. Steve Archibald went to Borough School and then Bobby went to St. Colin Kills. Right. Uh, I mean, he's one of the greatest players I've ever seen. Bobby yeah. Murdoch. I think absolutely outstanding football. Uh, yet, I think he got, he got something like 14 caps for Scotland. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you think that Darren Jackson got 28. Yeah. The players are on 150 caps nowadays, you know. I mean, I mean, I, I, 100 cap was a big thing. You see half of these course. players in the England team have got 100 caps. Aye, but more, aye, exactly. Wild. Yeah. Well, I remember George Young, the great Scotland, uh, yeah. Rangers, Scotland cap. It was a big thing when he got to 50 caps. He was the first one to make it, you know. But back in those days, uh, international, well, British international teams only played the home internationals. Yeah, of course. Not yeah. friendly, but it was mostly the home internationals. I tell you what, they're, they're certainly. There's a lot of players nowadays who get the same caps on more than players from Dalglish's era and stuff, but you won't get any that are scoring as many goals as no. the players did back then. I mean, I can't even think who our top scorer would have been in the last 20 years, 30 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's, that's a good question, Andrew. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, would there be some... I mean, is... Um, What's his name? Uh, the, the boy from Aston Villa. I mean, he must be up there. No, he's John McGinn. Uh, he's got thirteen or something. Right. Um, he's a. Uh, he's another one of these energy players. Never yeah. stop. Flashing player. Yeah. Um, he's got the Kenny Dalglish backside as well, hasn't he? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and knows how to use it, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's ter- uh, but I was just watching that. I think on Sky the other week there, uh, and it was Liverpool were playing, uh, 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 sorry, Man United, and it was a real, I think it was two each, with about six or seven minutes to go, and Big Hansen came out of defence, and he just, it was a great pass, but the Gleesh knew where it was going, you know, he just, yeah. and he, he didn't have to beat anybody, he just, excuse me, get right into the, great, the proper position. And what a goal it was. And I was sitting thinking about all the goals I'd seen him scoring for Scotland. He scored one against Spain at Hamden. Oh, wonderful top, goal. Top oh, corner. Aye, smasher. Another one at, in Belgium. In Belgium. Mm. And he turned just inside the, the the penalty area and crashed it right into the top corner as well with yeah. his left. And the header, of course. The, the, was it the header in 77, was it, down in Nanfield? Mm. Aye, aye. Yeah. yeah. Just, but he glided. Aye. He hit the ball. He hit the ball like a golf wedge. He just, he just glided. There was no. There wasn't even a big back lift. You see even pictures of yeah. him. He just, he just, he just moved beautifully. He was a beautifully balanced footballer. And again, he like Maradona, the ground, low center of gravity and a big arse. You know? Well, it, it, it crossed the ground as if he was floating, didn't he? Yeah, fun. absolutely beautiful footballer. A great story about that night in the Holiday Inn, in um, in Liverpool. I was we were in the bar, and somebody said. Uh, have you written a song? And I went, aye, aye. I said, but it's not complete yet. Get up on the table and sing it. And I went, <laughs> so I got up and sung it. And there's guys coming up, oh, you want to make that into a record? Why do we? The usual. And anyway, quietened in. And who comes over at the end of the bar but uh, Sidney Devine's brother? <laughs> now, 
Sydney's, uh, I'm trying to remember his first name, he had a pub in Muirkirk, you know, and I'd worked for him, I'd done gigs for him. Anyway, he came in, how are you doing, blah, blah, blah. And somebody said, that was a tragedy, eh? He always died. And Sydney's brother says, well, I, it was, he says, but it just leaves a door open for real Sydney, right? So, <laughs> Those guys, those guys jumping out of the bar, you know what I mean? Um, the, the days, you know, and there's, uh, oh, what was his name? I can't remember Sydney's brother's name. But the, the football fan uh, in 74 and, seven, and 82. Even. Were different. even. Uh, and, and the respect that they'll get. Nowadays, you've got this social media and they're coming mm-hmm. on, you can, Call them Mickey Mouse's ears. You don't know, you don't know who they are. And they can say anything about any player or any yeah. club. I think I call them the twats on Twitter because I'm sure that you know they've no. I don't think they've ever seen it. By the way, they carry on about it. Mm. Uh, I, I would, if it, I don't know who, who would do it. Maybe Elon Musk will do it. Mm. To take part in Twitter, you must. Give your proper name. It's like a passport. You should have a yeah, passport. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So you, if you insult anybody, then they can put you off it or whatever. You're responsible for it. Yeah, I think if you if you put twats on Twitter, though, it's a whole different conversation we're going to have. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Dra- dragging us back to Steve Archibald's predictions, <laughs> he, was, he was quite he was quite prophetic, wasn't he? And that. I mean, it's easy to say, but you know, the group was going to come down to goal difference, which ultimately, yeah. you know, Scotland's yeah. Scotland's well known for for being the the, the goal difference kings or the losers. Uh, the men, yeah, know. yeah. So what have we got? We've got uh, Joe Jordan here, um, Frankie Gray, um, John Robertson, and Asa Hartford. Is that? No, he's a Aye. Aye, Asa. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, Frankie Gray. Uh, and his brother Eddie were two fine. Fa- just two Fabulous brothers that yeah. played international football for Scotland. That yeah. they stayed in Castlemilk. That, that you know, it was just it was great to see boys like that. You know, getting through the the boy like Bobby Murdoch or Stevie Archibald, and there's, yeah. there's towns all over the, the, the Scotland that the guys like Martin Buchan going to Manchester United and all that sort of stuff. Billy Bremner coming for. Uh, uh, Alex Smith, I think, who lives now in Australia, but he was manager of Aberdeen for a while. Mm. And he's a cracking guy, Alex. Yeah. And he told me a story about he, he played for Cowie Juveniles. Um, it was first-class Juveniles League. Uh, Cowie's a, 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 a mining village in, in Stirling. He right. says, um, 10 men, MD, anybody around about that can play for it, but this wee red did boy, he says, I'll play, mister. And the guy, the guy that was running the team said, what age is that? He said, 12. He said, no. Oh. He says, oh, these boys are 18 and 19. He said, I can't put you. Well, just keep a game, will you? He's a... They put him on. Alex Smith says it was Billy Bremner. He says, he ran the team. He ran the, the game. He says, he was just, you could see it right away. What a yeah, yeah. Was, you know? And it was just, I've got a picture on my phone of Bobby Murdoch with all the all the people from St. Colm Kills holding them up with a buttercup. Uh, really? Yeah. 1953. And there he was uh, 14 years later. He's holding up the European Cup. You know, it's it's just yeah. great to see guys like that, you know. And, and what, what do you think then about the way football is now, the way kids grow up? We were talking about this before as well one time. In one of the other shows. I mean, what, what do you think about is what is the big difference between the way they grew up and the way they played football and the way they learned football and the way it's taught and people play now? Right, I've got a pal, Jimmy Nisbet, his name is. And on Sunday, I uh, I went over to the county inn along with Ian Durant. And Jimmy, Jimmy's got a season, how many sons? I've got a season book at Celtic Park. And they helped to run Canvas Line. Uh, it's, it's like... They play five asides, you know. They call them the the fourteens. The, the they mean two thousand fourteen, you know. Yeah. That's when they were born, and they're all eight, you know, eight year olds, the wee boys, yeah. big boys. And there's a lassie there, uh, and we were presenting their trophies to them, you know. And I mm. said to Jimmy, I says, "This is fantastic." And I says, "All these people who are bringing their kids along, 
is really, you know, incredible. And he says, well, that's the way it is now. And I said, do the, the parents, you know, uh, get too involved? He says, we don't allow them to criticise. Right. The parents say, they're, they're eight years of age. They just go out and enjoy themselves. Yeah, yeah. Now, but they've got all the equipment. They've got the right ball. Exactly. The when track I played, on it. Yeah. yeah, when I played with the BB, geez, what? I, I remember, I, I, I used to deliver cold briquettes. Do you remember? You'll not remember when you're too young. But cold briquettes were uh, cold dust and they were yeah. formed into a, a brick, a briquette. And they came like two dozen and you put them in the fire and they burned away for hours and hours and hours. They were cheaper than coal. Yeah. Right. And I delivered them with a guy in uh, Rutherglen. And I was 12 years of age and I, w- I was playing with the BB, you know, and sometimes you were held up with cold briquettes. You had to go uh, to the, straight to the BB game. And I mean, you can imagine the colour of me, right? Yeah. With these cold briquettes. And for the first two years I played with the BB, they thought I was pearly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, only up to I get the ball. <laughs> John Lappy was a coach. <laughs> <laughs> but you played in the streets. World, that, well, Andy, uh, Simon, you played in the streets. You know, you put jackets in and all right. that. And, uh, and you, it was great if you had a ball because you were set to get a game. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah. And all the worst players played in goals. That was, that's how it was, you know. And I, I was there lucky. There were so many more pitches then as well. Even, even there was, because Blaze, obviously, we all grew up playing Blaze pitches. Uh-huh. There were so many more of them. There, there isn't yeah. that anymore. You know, there's, no, there's, there's 50 pitches. You know, and, there was, and there was Glasgow Green. Yeah, um, 50 we, pitches. And, yeah. We, we were lucky in our street. We had a kite in Green. Do you know what? Kite, that's Coits, Q-U-O-I-T-S. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like a horseshoe, but at the handle. And you yep. threw it 21 yards onto a clay head, That's a right. circular head with a pin in the middle. And the secret was to get, if you got the, the pin in the middle of the coin, yep. that was three points, right? And there'd be 2,000 people there. Wow. The, the, the Scottish Championship there and all that. But every weekend, there'd be a kite match. You know, people would come from uh, mining villages all over central Scotland. And in the summer, we get playing football and we then need to play in the street. It's fantastic. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. You, what you said, uh, Simon, the red blaze, you know, you made a side and tackle, Chris, you knew about it for a fortnight, you know. But, but it meant you could play all the time. That's they, right. They needed, they needed no upkeep. They were just raked. And then that's that right. Yeah, absolutely. If you look at how many pitches have been lost in Britain generally, not just Scotland, but especially, I would say, in the Glasgow area, the uh, pitches have disappeared. And even if you're running a team, you're running amateur teams, all those teams played for years at all these pitches. It didn't right. need changing rooms. You didn't have changing rooms. You're lucky if you had a bath or whatever. So, so that is gone. That's what amateur football is. There's, there's, there's less than a tenth of the teams there were when I was young. Yeah. That, 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 I mean, that's, where, that's where these players came from and that's where young kids learned to play against big guys and men. You know? Well, exactly. That, we had the, the Churches League uh, yeah. in Glasgow and it was all, all the, the, the Church of Scotland parishes and the Catholics yeah. with the Boys Guild yeah. You know, uh, and all the great players. I mean, that team that Bobby Murdoch played for St. Colin Kills, the guys like Danny McNulty and uh, uh, Joe Dolan and John yeah. McMeekin. And, uh, you know, when you remember them all because they were all great players as well. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I, still, I still wonder how Johnny McMeekin never made it the same as Bobby, Bobby Murdoch. He was a yeah. fantastic player. Yeah. But yeah, I think there's, there's players like that all over the. Uh, the country absolutely the real, you know, full of them, wasn't it? yeah players, uh, players, but yeah. again it's either by accident or whether by lifestyle or just or like whatever, people, yeah. up, you know. but the talent that i just think that and this is my personal view is that the talent doesn't seem to be there anymore because there was there's so many distractions now for 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 kids and things as well computer games cool. you know, yeah. industry, that kind of thing is that's where these that's where the eddie grays came from you know, that's right. where these guys, you know, the Billy Brenners, they were they were they, they were they were kind of they were kind of shaped and moulded by, right. by the way they grew up and played football, rough and tumble. Mm-hmm. And that's why they're not phased when they get to the FA Cup final and somebody's grabbing them by the by the neck. You know what I mean? That they weren't afraid to go play against Brazilians. Yeah. And it's I amazing wonder, how... I wonder where it is now. It just seems a little bit 
a little bit. There's the boys that are great in school, and the boys get picked up and they go into the academy system, and that seems to just churn the best talent up and spit it out. Well, you're right. I, I just this. You look back. I remember being at Fair Hill, uh, and John Lambie was the manager, mm. and invited me into his office after the game. And I was sitting, and all the press guys were there. I was sitting in a seat at the back. You can't believe that, can you? I was sitting there, mouth shut. <laughs> I was sitting there. Don't get over Fair Hill. <laughs> exactly. And John was a great do man, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, he loves fleeing the do's. Anyway, we were talking about. Uh, certain players and there was a boy who played for Thistle and I can't remember his name but Thistle's support just didn't like him and I, Lambie said to Big Alan Davis I'll never forget this he says come and watch him at the training and he says he's, he's unbelievable and Alan Davis says so what happens on Saturday he says there's people watching on Saturday at the training <laughs> and that and, and he swore that there was a lot of players like that could yeah, you yeah. Crowd, you yeah. know, performance anxiety, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think it might be. Yeah, see, I, yeah. I, I think a couple, of, a couple of things that you're talking about. My opinion is that the everything has to be organised now. Yeah, so you have to have organised pitch and pay for it, and yeah. you have to organise the, the referee yeah. and all this, and it all has to be organised. Guarding in place for everyone. Yeah, pe- be, people just don't turn up for yeah. for games and go out and play. Secondly, yeah. I think. I think there's, a, there's a, an argument that kids are overcoached. So yeah. rather than just developing their own style of game, which is what your Jimmy Johnson's and that would have done, is they would have just... Well, also, the like size of the ball. I've always been a big thing about the Brazilian way. Which we don't, you don't get a full-size football until your leg bones have joined and you're 13, 14 yeah. years old. You play, you play the young with a golf ball, a tennis ball, and you use a size three ball. Can I just say this? I, I would agree to a certain extent there, but there's good sides to it too. I, my grandson, who's uh, nine now, he lives in Mallorca, and he come home, and I, I says, I'll take you up to Auchinhoe to see the mm. training. You know, and I phoned Craig Mulholland, and he said, I bring him up. So him and his sister come up with me, and we walked in, and he said, just come along here. And every one of these young boys who were, you know, in the under-16s and that, they got up when we walked into the the, the room, you know, the, where they ate for the lunch. Mm. Every one of them got up and came over and said, welcome to Rangers. Wow. And, back in my seat. Mm. and uh, I said to him, Geez, that, 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 that's really terrific to see. He says, yeah. see when we go away, he says, let's say we're playing at Easter Road. He says, they don't get near the bus until the dressing room's cleared. Yeah. Cleared. Mm. You know, and all, all the teams do that. Yeah. And that, I think that's a good side of it. It is. It's, it's, and it's kind of replaced kind of the old apprentice system as well, you know, which was outlawed. Aye. But that's how young players learned. You know, you were, you yeah. were basically, you know, assigned to a, a senior player. And uh-huh. that was, you know, and you learned that way. And in the afternoons, you did extra training and then you cleaned the stands. That's you know, right. You yeah. the stadium and you did extra training and then you played maybe three or four nights a week as well. So that whole system has gone, unfortunately, and I think that I think even the reserve league that way, it's all now going to under twenties when you yeah. get to elite level. So can I tell you a story? Mm. I'm not uh, sorry to interrupt, Simon. I'm just no. at my age, I need to tell you before it gets out my head and I forget it. I, I did a, I spoke at Jimmy Miller's funeral. Now you wouldn't you know Jimmy Miller? He mm. played in the sixties for Rangers. He's my favourite ever Rangers player. I thought right. he was just a great, you know, terrific player. Anyway, Jimmy's a lovely, lovely guy. I'm at a dinner, oh, 25, 30 years ago, and I'm sitting next to David Hay, you know, the quiet assassin. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> the silver fist and the, the velvet glove. Yes. He, he was a lovely guy. He, he, yeah, was, yeah. he was the same guy who played for him. He was a hard, hard player. And he... <clears throat> Chatting away, and he says, How long have you been going? Oh, I says, I've been going since I was five, David. But, and and who, who would you be your favourite? And I said, No, de- doubt. I said, Jimmy Miller. I said, mm. I don't think you. He says, I played against Jimmy Miller. I says, When he was at Rangers, he says, No. He said, He went to uh, Dundee United and he played left half. He says, right. And I was 17 and I played uh, Celtic for Celtic Reserves at Tanadex, 17 years of age. And here's this guy. Jimmy was in his 30s, late 30s at the time. He says, and I'll tell you what, he says, 
we kicked each other up and down the park. He says, well, yeah. weren't we? You know, I was uh, intimidated. And mm. the, the point of the story was, uh, the final whistle, he says, Jimmy ran towards me. He says, he's going to gub me, you know, because it's so, uh, no violent, but just intense. And he came up and he went, See, son, you've got a great chance at this game. He says, you stick in. He says, that was great. And she goes, really? and they walked off the park together. And David never forgot that. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I, I Peter, think... Yeah, Peter Latchford just talked about it as well, about, about, you know, in the reserves and how much they learned as well. I'm Aye. watching opposition players, that, you know, would keep a winger in. John Gray yeah. did it as well. He would tell people, what are you doing, son? I'll, I'll, you know, if you cut inside me, I'm, I'm bad on that leg, go. Yeah. Lift it over my leg. If you go this side, I'll push you out into the running track. That, that, they, they guided yeah. each other. They were all professionals playing with no stress. But then it comes back to your point then on about why is he no good on a Saturday because there's a crowd. I see. <laughs> and, and, uh, J- Jimmy Johnson told me a story about Greggy. They were standing in the tunnel at Celtic Park. And he said, Jimmy, said, you go by me. That's fine, he says. See, you come back and try and go by me again, he says. Yeah. He said, you'll be in the jungle along with your pals. <laughs> <laughs> he told the story. It's a great story. It's brilliant, isn't it? It's, brilliant. Uh, it's a snapshot of that older world as well. But again, it's just, uh, just football's just changed that much. But again, it's it's high stakes now. I mean, it always was. But now it's jeopardy and high stakes and a lot more it. money involved in it. So it is a different game. And we've all got to, I guess, go uh, with it. But yeah, but you do hark after those days, you know. And I think also you were closer to the players. Certainly you were, Andy, as well. You know, you've, you've been around, uh, I have yeah. to, to a certain extent as well, been around players an awful lot. And the uh, stories the, 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 the stories of the dressing room, the famous incidents and the games and the ones you uh, watched, and to hear what went on afterwards, I always found t- tremendously interesting. Yeah. You, know? you never repeat them, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. I talked to Bobby Lennox maybe yeah. once a week, you know, and... yeah. Uh, He's one of the loveliest guys in the world, Bobby. Lovely, lovely man. And he told me, I, I, I had related to him that uh, Billy McNeil, who played for the Vintners that I go off with, mm. uh, told the story about uh, when they won the European Cup and he went up, he says, like, you're the captain. You need to go up and see we got our eyes, you know, uh, for next season. And long story short, Billy goes up and he walks in and George Steen sent to the desk. What is it, Billy? He says, what? Well, uh, we were just talking, boss, and I'm a spokesman who wondered about our eyes, you know, about the, you know, you said, I wonder about the terms for next uh, season. Same terms as last season, right? Shut your door on the way out. And Billy, Billy went into the toilet and sat for half an hour because he, he went down and took, so I argued with him for half an hour there, but he wouldn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> it was as quick as that. No, same terms as last season, shut your door on the way out. And, <laughs> Bobby Leonard said, we knew, you know, we all knew it would happen because he knew what he was, you know. <laughs> Great, isn't it? Another so, story. I, I was saying to uh, Bobby once, I said, I remember a game itself uh, at Ibrox and uh, somebody threw a bottle on for the, the West Enclosure, the East Enclosure at Ibrox. Mm. It was one of those screw taps, right? And the court was in it and he threw it on it and it landed on the side of the pitch and big Tommy Gamble was near and he picked it up and Kenny Donnie had a drink. Uh-huh. <laughs> he used to close your body. You know, <laughs> there was characters like that in the game. Yeah. And there seems to be a separation now between players and fans as well. You see them, they're always, they're always laughing at these coming off the bus shots in the World Cup as well. But it's the uh, headphones. The headphones, they're miles away from all the fans. There's no... I saw a thing yeah. with... There was, there was a, a documentary I was watching and, and, and the Cameroon uh, team from the Italia 90. And there's some great footage in it. But also, they've got the beaten Argentina, they've beaten Maradona, and Maradona's just sitting been interviewed by, by the equivalent of the Evening Times. Just now, you all outside the, the access they had was completely different. Absolutely. You were to, to, to the game, you know? Aye. Well, I wonder if in the, what was that, 78, 40 years ago, it's, uh, you wonder if we're going to be talking about the players of today, or if it's going to be football. Who mm-hmm. knows what the world's going to throw up? Or what a World Cup song was. Huh? There we go. Well, no, I'm not saying that. No, no, no. <laughs> Andy, Andy well, you're a mortal. Right. You're no, right. of Bill Shankly, you're an immortal. <laughs> <laughs> no. Did you not ask for 82, Andy, to do the song in 82? I did, I did a song in 82, but it didn't go anywhere, you know. It, it was, I mean, Ali's Tartan Army was a one-off, you know. Oh, it was good. 
the, the thing that people say to me, that what made it so popular, and there's one line in it, you know, uh, we're going to do or die because England couldn't do it because they didn't qualify. That, yeah, that, was, yeah. a hook. that was a hook great. line, you know. It's a great and line. Uh, oh, I, it's, well, it's, I still think that, you know, going on to the top of the pops in 1978 and my dad and my two brothers in the studio. <laughs> right? And Well, you know the story. That I know the story. <laughs> Generation X comes in the door. <laughs> The big fella looks at me, who the fuck are you? And before I could say it, my old oh, man's like, who are you talking to? <laughs> and then he said, that's my boy. I'm 38 of the thing. <laughs> anyway. This was Billy Idol, boys. Yeah, Billy yeah, Idol. Yeah. Aye, that's right. Aye. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, dear. However, that, oh, it's so good. It's so good. But, but, uh, 82 was John Gordon Sinclair, wasn't it? It was his. It was his aye, yeah, Robertson. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, Christian so, as well, yeah. Aye. Yeah. Certainly better than sea lines. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're on to page six. <laughs> so how long is that taking to get to page we're six? melting through it. <laughs> um, aye, aye. So Jeff will shake them anyway, up. I'm going to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm aging. <laughs> okay, so this is Jeff Hurst has agreed to take on the Kuwait job to try and uh -huh. see them qualify for the 1986 World Cup, but he'll be doing all he can to see that England get victory over them at this World Cup, as he's one of Ron Greenwood's coaches at the tournament. Uh, the article also mentions that Dave Mackay is currently coaching in Kuwait. Um, did you know Dave? No, I never met him, but uh, Greggy told me a story when he was a young international, you know, he got his first cap for Scotland. They would be allowed out for a night, you know, and they'd go... And they got a baby, which was allowed. Excuse me. And Dave, Dave Mackay, he rooms with Dave Mackay, and Dave Mackay woke him up six o'clock in the morning. Right, come on, we're going for a run. <laughs> Greg he went, what? We're going for a run. He said, and they're out running. Greg he said, you doing? He says, this is your bank account. He says, this will keep you going to your thirties. You know, and you uh -huh. play in your thirties. And see, every time I think of that story, I think about Jimmy Johnston, Jim Baxter, two of the best players you've ever seen, yeah. right? They were at the game at 28. Billy mm -hmm. McNeil and John Gregg, captain of Rangers, Celtic and Rangers, played on to 35 and 36. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's why they did it, you know. In the bank. It's great. It's a great expression, isn't it? Aye. It's just... The, 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 I mean, a, a similar story with the, so with the basketball. I think it was Shaquille O'Neal and the players were given a rare night off in their training camp. And they all go out and they have a wild night. They're all multi-millionaires and they have a wild night and they're all coming back and they come into the hotel at 4.35 in the morning and they meet uh -huh. Shane O'Neill coming into reception who just looks at them. And where are you going? He said, I'm going to the gym. He said, and that was the last day. He said, we all had to chat that afternoon. But we're all, we're all hangover in training, totally, totally uh -huh. hanging. And then the next day, three. Day after that, five. And by the end of the week, the, the entire squad was down at half four in the morning training with him. Yeah, because good. This yeah. guy is diff an elite, different level. So you raise your yeah. game. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's in the well, bank. That's to prove that you get nothing for nothing. Yeah, you don't train uh, football. It's going to catch up with you. Very, yeah. very. I mean, you look at Gascoigne. What Smith says to me, I said to, I said he never had an ounce of fat on him. He said he was a natural athlete, Andy. You know, he says he just he, he trained. He says he was a smashing trainer. He says, uh -huh. but he, he could have played. See if he was out two or three weeks, he could play him because he was naturally fit, you know. So, well, I think it's sad that players like him, and there's a lot of them, never got to play in a World Cup. Fight. There's Messi. Yeah. You know, I would love to see him in a World Cup final. Yeah. I, th yeah. I, th I think with Messi, the, the sad thing, I mean, because Messi's just one of the greatest players. You know, the only yeah. one I think comes close to him is Maradona, who I think is is better. But oh yeah, but oh, Messi yeah. will always there will always be this judgment on him that he never won a World Cup, which is unfair. Yeah. Of course, it's unfair, Andy. Aye. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a squad game. Mm. Yeah, and you look at Pele. Yeah. You look at nineteen seventy. Look at the squads they have. But the best team again, and we come back to the eighty two. The best team generally never to win the World Cup was Brazil in nineteen eighty two. That's right, and they get beaten in the semi-final by Italy. Italy. 
another one, and I, I saw this on television, 1958 Cup Final, World Cup Final, and a 17-year-old boy from Brazil yeah. scored two goals. Yeah. You know, and they, they, they talked about Messi and Maradona, uh, who were, in my opinion, Pele's the best I've ever seen. Because yeah. there was never any scandal with Pepe. He was never into uh, Pele. He was never into drugs mm-hmm. or anything like that. And he played to well into, I think it was about 40 when he stole, yeah. although it was American all that. But what a player he was. And Billy Bremner. He came in the damage took, and he played with the big ball and he played with the big boots. He came to the 50s era into modern think, football. Absolutely. But Billy, you know, Billy Bremner told the story. Different, you can't, you can't but, pick between him and Maradona, I would say. In our, in our generation of, of modern football, you would say, that started, say, 1967 onwards, 1970, really. From uh-huh. that generation, is Maradona. And I think, I think Messi is potentially nearly as good, but Maradona is, I think, was just born to... Born to Cristiano this. Ronaldo as well. You know, I know Ronaldo, you know? I think he's also, he's also built himself into that because he's worked hard at it. Maradona was born like that. Uh, well, I, did, I was at a dinner, well, speaking at a dinner once, and they had a Q&A with Billy Bremner and Gordon McQueen. And uh, the, whoever was doing the crack, it may have been Dougie Donnelly, and they said, so... Who's the best player you've ever played against, you know? Uh, and Bremner said, well, he says, talk about best and Charlton and Law. He says, they're all great players, you know? He says, but I played against Pelly. He says, and it was at Hamden. He says, yeah. they're friendly in the 66. He says, and I'm saying in the, the dressing room, don't worry about him, I'll sort him out in the first 10 minutes. But I say, he says, and he got the ball, he says, and I just hit him, you know? He yeah. says, and I bounced off him. Wow. I literally bounced off him. He says it was absolute granite. Yeah. Muck, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's a different... I keep saying this. It's a different game yeah. in the stand than it is on the pitch. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I, I, that's the one that I think Stevie Chalmers just for the last five minutes just stuck to him, didn't he? So he could get his jersey after the game. That's right. Absolutely. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. And there's, there's a guy who scores a winning goal in the European Cup final. It might not have been in the team if Joe McBride hadn't got injured. Because yeah, Joe yeah. had scored 33 goals up to December. Yeah. Incredible. Isn't it? Isn't it? So this this next article here says Millionaire Bingham. Um, and it's quite it's quite a nice wee story here. So in Madrid, after the draw for the World Cup was made, Jock Steen stabbed a finger at Northern Ireland manager Billy Bingham and said, you're going to qualify from that group. You're going to be a soccer millionaire. Having already drawn with Yugoslavia in the first game, Northern Ireland would go on to draw with Honduras before a famous win, which you spoke about earlier, Andy, against Spain. I don't know. Uh-huh. Um, so, proving Big Jock's prediction correct. So, I thought that was a nice wee story in there. Um, yeah, who was yeah. the The Armstrong, was that his name? Yeah, Jerry so, Armstrong. Yeah, I think he Armstrong scored in every game, did he? He scored, but he scored the goal against Spain. Yeah. Uh, the one no victory. Jimmy, Jimmy Nickel tells a great story about that game. Yeah. Um, he was playing against Zico, and as a, you know, the teams were walking out together. He said, "Me, Jersey, you know." Mm. Uh, Zico said, "See, because I don't." He spoke a lot of English. Yeah. You know, picked in English. He said, and we swapped, and he said, "See," and he looked at Jimmy Nichols' number, uh-huh. right, Northern Ireland number two. Okay, and we uh, we played Brazil, and uh, I'm trying to think. It wasn't maybe not that World Cup, but anyway, they played in '86. Anyway, after it, uh, the Irish players, Jimmy says, all the Irish players went away in to the other dressing room to see if they could shots. He says, Zico. Uh, and he said, no, no, Northern Ireland, uh, number two, gets my shot. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. They come back in and they're going, can you believe it? That's Zico. He didn't get his shot off him. He says it was going to you. And Jimmy went, oh. All right, he says, if Zico wants to give me a shot, he says, I'll take it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's brilliant. (laughs) So the next one in this page is is Northern Ireland as well, and it's Sammy McElroy fears referee bias in the final game against Spain, with them being the host nation. He affects they'll be affected by the large partisan crowd, which I guess is a natural thing to, yeah. to to think about. Uh, it didn't happen, though. No, but it, was it the 
I don't, it wasn't that. Was it that game that the uh, Mal Donaghy got ordered off? And yeah, I was right. up with 10 men. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's right. I, and I mean, that's that's some going. And you have a look at the players that were a big Pat Jennings. I've never seen hands as big as that. Mm. Yeah, Jimmy, yeah. Hey, sorry, Jimmy. Oh, it doesn't matter. Jesus, it's seven names to get out of my head. But Pat Jennings, Chris, and Jimmy Nichol. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nel, Sammy Nelson, Martin O'Neill, uh, they all played, and a Rangers player played for that team. Uh, and uh, tell me who it was. John McClelland. That's right. Well yeah. done, son. John McClelland. And Nor- Norman Whiteside, that was his first uh, World Cup. He was wow. yeah. something. He was a, a player too, was he? Yeah. yeah. And there's a, there's a decent book on that uh, Northern Ireland uh, campaign. Got it here. Feels oh, a wonder. It? Uh, Evan Marshall. Feels a wonder. Who wrote it? Uh, Evan Marshall. All right. Uh-huh. I remember there was an old old guy, he was a journalist with the best Belfast Telegraph. What was his name? Brody. Malcolm Brody. Malcolm Brody. Aye. Yeah. And uh, it's just amazing. Mm. You go to, uh, you go back now, your memory takes you back. I remember being at uh, Windsor Park, sitting in the stand and who came in and sat right in front of me about Charlie Tully. Wow. Uh, I, I mean, Charlie Tully was a character wow. uh, in Scotland football. Scotland won 6 1, and all the goals were scored with Rangers players. Uh, I think D- Ralphie Brand got a hat trick, Alex mm-hmm. Scott got one, uh, and David Wilson got two, something like that. But anyway, and uh, Charlie Tully had the place in uproar, just his pattern. You know, yeah. he, he, he was really, really fit. And I, mm-hmm. I, I've got a story about Charlie Tully, which to me, is completely Glasgow humour. Yeah. Pope Pius XII died, right? And uh, Charlie Tully was looking for a transfer, right? He wasn't, even ha- he wasn't happy at Celtic Park. And apparently, uh, the Glasgow Herald, you know these uh, posters they put up outside uh, news agents, you know, that like, tells you the headline, yeah. right? The Daily Record says that Rangers were saying so and so and that. And these two appeared, and it's uh, New Pope Chosen. And the next day it says Tully leaves Celtic. That's <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've been very good at corners, eh? Mm-hmm. I had very uh, uh, there's another record that's just come back into my head, Charlie Tully. Mm-hmm. At Falkirk, there's so many Celtic supporters there that were you know they would come over the defence, but they were sitting down mm-hmm. and he he got a corner and uh, he took it. Scored directly from the corner. For some reason, the referee said there was an infringement, and if you take it again, and he scored again, again, yeah, place with the same and, corner, yeah. And with the and with the boots and that ball, you know what I mean? You imagine yeah. the pitch, like just just a, just a wizard, you know. And he looked like a wee old man as well. That's what I loved about Charlie Tully. Just he right. always looked fifty, you know. So right. what a player! What a player! What a personality <laughs> it was as well. But yeah, center halves, Simon used to mm. clear the really. Sodden day, he just booted yeah. the ball up the park, yeah. And the, the opposite centre half would heed it back, and you always knew a centre half because they didn't neck. We heed on that ball, I'm sure that's why it was all stick on collars. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <a real reason. laughs> I'm sure Charlie Tully was um, one of my dad's heroes. I'm sure yeah. Charlie Tully yeah. was. So I, that, I was brought up with the name, you know, yeah. I've, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a here somewhere as well, yeah. Mm-hmm. Brilliant, brilliant.